so willing make a whoopee. started at the beginning, when I was a little younger, before I could go in there, they used to have a, what they call a breakfast dance, you know, every Monday. They'd have people like Count Basie coming through, and they always had a regular band up there. And I used to stand on the outside and listen to them. And when I became of age, they, they let me come in and sit in with them, you know. And then as the years developed, I eventually worked there. I think the last time I worked there was in 59. I had my own group in there. I had Abe Woodley on vibes and a fellow out of Philadelphia. I can't think of his name right now. A wonderful drummer. And uh, had uh, James Richardson. We called him Beams, the bass player. He was on bass. Had a quartet. And we stayed there quite a while. And then later on, uh, Joe Henderson came in and joined me. We had a quintet, you know. Stayed there quite a while. It was fun, you know. And, uh, and, and naturally, uh, being the house band, they brought in people like Sonny Stitz and uh, Horace Silvers, you know, all the top notch. We were the house band, they'd come in for about 10 days. And so it was very educational, you know, musically. So when you, when you were younger, and you said you, you, you would stand outside watching, what, what time was that? Oh, that was, we'd say, in the, in the late 30s. What kind of sound were they blowing? It was, it was still into that, uh, let's see, what could I call it? A little swing area, you know what I mean? Into a swing area at that time. But it, uh, to me, it, it sounded good, you know. What about the sound? What attracted you to it? Uh, the feel, the feeling, the musical feel that they had, you know, for it. And that concept, that's what drew me. I was up there every, every night, you know. Yes, I had a <clears throat> attempted to play, you know, <laughs> and uh, I was coming along, you know, because I was in a fast company. I had, that time you had three or four big bands in the neighborhood. Right. I, it was one band that I worked with, uh, Wardell Gray was in it, it was called Isaac Goodwin's group. That's when I first ran into Wardell, and he was phenomenal, you know, I used to scare me to death, you know, <laughs> at that age, you know. And uh, they had another band around there called Larry Douglas. These were all big bands. Every Sunday, we uh, it's another time, we used to go down to the, they had a ballroom down on Woodward. I forget the name of it now. Great no, it wasn't the no. Greystone. It's another ballroom. They had, I uh, can't remember that name. But anyway, uh, we'd uh, 
we have what they call a battle of music down there. They had a, a band from the east side, Matthew Rucker. That's when I first met Yusuf. He was Bill Evans then, you know. And uh, he was with that band. They had a good band, you know. And so I was with Isaac, and we used to have a battle with him every Sunday. It was fun, you know. That way you got to know all the musicians all around the city, you know. So that was my first exposure to uh, two of them playing jazz in big bands, you know. I left uh, Detroit. I was working with a band named King Kolax out of Chicago. We were working down there at a club down in the valley called Three Sixes. I was working down there with them. They had the likes of uh, Gene Ammons in that band, you know. It was real fun, you know. I mean, real fun. Uh, I got a good lesson, put it, put it that way, you know. And I left with them in 42. We went on the road. I stayed with them for about two years. By that time, the music was changing, you know what I mean? The Yardy came on the scene, and uh, Eckstein had started a band. So Jug went with uh, Eckstein, and uh, later on, I went with uh, McShann, you know. That's how, because I left the band in 44 in North Fork, to be exact. And from there, I started just going, you know, different places, playing, you know, freelancing, like, you know. And uh, I wound up in McShann's band for about 18 months. What did you do? Or where did you travel with McShann? All over. We traveled from the East Coast to the West Coast. What kind of stuff were you doing? We were doing blues and swing and just Kansas City groove, you know. That's why I really. It really uh, enlightened me on the blues, you know. I thought that, I thought it wasn't anything. That shows you how slow I was, you know. <laughs> but I got uh, I got educated, you know. What's this Kansas City groove? Well, they had a certain feel. Like, it's like they had a certain feel in Detroit. It's hard to describe, but uh, it had a had a nice uh, beat to it. You know what I mean? You, was, you know, you could identify with it. You know, you could feel it. Make you patch your foot, you know. Well, there's, what's this? You said there, there was a Detroit sound. Yeah. What, what, what was the Detroit sound? Detroit sound was, uh, was, was close akin to that, I would say. You know what I mean? They had the guys uh, that I came up with around here at that time, they, they were very dedicated and uh, they had a lot of pride. You know what I mean? It was steady, you know. You had, and, and you wouldn't dare go up on the bandstand unless you thought you were ready. You know what I mean? That's the kind of thing that I don't see today, you know. Guy jump on the bandstand today, you know, can't even blow his nose, you know. But what are you gonna do with it, you know, you don't wanna hurt him, you know, embarrass him and all that, you know. But it was it was a different thing, you know, a different time. You have to real you know, I realize that. And another thing, you had uh, your uh, the people that patronized you, they they were up on it. You know what I mean? They were alert. They knew what you were doing. You know, and you had a following, you know, and, and another thing I wanted to inject is that uh, people used to dance to that music, you know. A lot of people claim you can't dance to it. They used to dance to it, you know what I mean? And so it was, that was a part of the thing. And, and another thing I wanted to inject when I was coming up around here is that uh, most clubs had floor shows, you know what I mean? Entertainment. It's always entertaining, and you, you don't find that too often in groups today, you know. You have to entertain the people also, you know. That doesn't mean you have to be a clown, you know. But you can, you know, entertain them, you know. You know, because they, they come to listen, you know. You can play for yourself at home, you know. You have to make them uh, happy. That's all it's about. If you make them happy, you feel better, you know. So who was in the chance band when you started the chance? Uh, Paul Quinnishy was there on tenor. And there's a little alto player out of Kansas City. We called him Schoolboy. He he could play. The band overall was a, a thrill for me. You know what I mean. I learned quite a bit there. You know, McShann. By the way, McShann was one of the, the more mild of band leaders. You know, he didn't give you any static. You know, he, real mild. You you had to be really out of it. You know, not to make it with him. You know. I wanted to say that about him. You know. Was nice to work. Really out of it? Huh? Was there anybody who was really out of it? Oh well, uh, if you were out of it, you'd excuse yourself. You know, you know what I mean. You just disappear. You know. <laughs> so what was it like being on the road with them? It was fun. 
That's all I can say, because you don't, you don't remember the misery, you know. At least I don't, you know. It was musical fun and everything, you know what I mean. Oh, the highlight for me was when we went to New York, you know. Uh, we, uh, we were working at the Savoy Ballroom. And they call it the track because uh, you had three bands up there, and as soon as one band gets through, another band starts playing. You work until 3 o'clock in the morning, you know. So they nicknamed it the track. It, you, you study, you had to be alert, you know. At the time we were up there, they had Erskine Hawkins Band and another group. I, can't recall the name of it. There's three bands up there at all times. You know how you get your signal from the from the theme song. They let you know they're getting ready to take off. You know, you're supposed to be ready when they get through. You know, <laughs> assembly line like. <laughs> I work with a, a number of groups. I work with a group. I don't know whether you're familiar with them. Snookum Russell. I worked a while with him. And uh, the most. Uh, Rewarding uh, money-wise that I, I work with a group down in Tampa, Florida. I uh, can't remember his name, but uh, Ray Charles was in that group. That's when Ray was real young, you know, as a sextet. That's the most money I ever made playing this horn, you know, with that. At that time, you know, a buck was a buck, you know. And uh, I even had a bank account, and I was amazed, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's why you make your money with, with uh, strange groups, you know. But uh, it was fun. I stayed down there quite a while, you know, and worked with them. That was a good experience, too, you know. It was different. The, the, the band, oh, by the way, was on a kick like uh, Louis Jordan, you know. It had that kind of effect. And Ray was uh, developing, and he was, they'd, uh, we had the horns would come off, and the rhythm section would play, and they'd make a trio out of it, you know. Still entertaining aspects of it, you know. So it was fun. That's, I really, I learned a lot of being around Ray too. By the way, good musician, excellent, you know. So then I met Cannonball. At this time, I'm, I'm meeting all these people in Florida. You know, Cannonball. That's when he's going to college, you know. And Blue Mitchell and all of them, you know. And then that Jackson, uh, I forget his name, his full name, Jackson, tenor player. I think they called him Gator Tail later on. He used to work with Bruce Brown, you know. So I met all those people down there, you know. And different, you meet so many people, but it's all about music, you know. Because the time you hit town, the guy said, OK, man, take your horn out, let's play, you know. And you're young, when you're young like that, you can do it, you know. Travel 400 miles, and when you get in town, take the horn out and start playing, you know. So it was, it was really fun, you know. I wouldn't advise an old man like me to try it now, you know. <laughs> that's, the, that's the kick I got out of it. I learned a long time ago not to just walk in and, and head straight for the bandstand, you know. That's disrespect, you know what I mean. Let the guy ask you, you know. That's a policy I've followed all my life, you know. I think it's a wise one. I don't care how good you can play, you don't do that, you know. Because they, they have their own program, you know. I put it all together, and I, I said, uh, I said, man, if you're going to stay in this, you got to learn your instrument better, and you got to play better, you know. You got to learn how to read better, you know, just overall. I had to overhaul myself, you know. So that's what I set out to do, you know. After I took care of some business here and there, that's, that's been my project. And I'm still, still doing that today, you know. Influenced by just about everybody musically, you know. I can truthfully say that. But my, my favorite, I, I would say, was Don Bias and naturally Coleman Hawkins. And you know uh, Charlie Parker influenced me. Then another, another alto player out of Kansas City called John Jackson. He influenced me quite a bit. Sonny Stitch, you know, it's, it's so many, you know. Wardell, you know what I mean, when I was real young. And so I had a, I had a, quite a few people that influenced me, you know. All right, one episode I remember in Orlando, Florida, we had a big band down there made up of uh, people from all around the country, musicians, very good musicians. Ray, Ray Charles on the piano, he had, uh, can't think of the name, Johnny Moore, another tenor player was there, he was excellent. In fact, they were all, 
real uh, good musician. Plus the leader was out of Philadelphia. He was a ranger. Anyway, one day at the rehearsal, we were rehearsing, and uh, I took a solo, and uh, Ray uh, spoke up and said, hey, man, are you going to play the turnaround, man? You know, turnaround. In uh, layman's terms is that when you play eight bars, I, seven bars, I would stop. I wouldn't they have what that eighth bar is supposed to be a turnaround to carry into the next eight. You understand me? So uh, I always would slow up there, you know. I'd pause, and he screamed at me. He said, hey, man, play the turnaround. I didn't know what you're talking about, you know, really. And, and I was too embarrassed to ask him, you know. <laughs> but I had to. They play a chord, man, and carry you back into, into that uh, next uh, eight bars. I said, okay, man, we got that straight. So that was, uh, everybody laughed. We got a good chuckle out of this, you know. <laughs> And uh, I wish you could have heard that band. It was phenomenal when I think about it, you know. When I, when I arrived here, you had Frank Foster here, Joe Henderson, Thad Jones. That was happening. Wardell just left. He was working up to the Bluebird with Frank when I got in. And uh, later on, uh, Billy Mitchell joined uh, Thad, and they were in there, you know, for a long time. That's what was happening. In the meantime, I was working with uh, Boo Boo. We had a place over here on, uh, what's it, Canfield and Abovian called uh, The Parrot. I was working with them, with uh, Boo Boo. He had Ali in the group and he had his, Ali's brother, uh, Oliver Jackson, on drums. Had a quartet. That was fun. That's, that's another one I can tell you about. I, uh, that time I was working out to the sodas and uh, trying to play too at night, you know. And so uh, no one woke me up, you know, one night. And when I woke up, it was 12 o'clock. You know I'm late. So I didn't even, you know, call down there or nothing. I said, well, I'm automatically fired. You know, I didn't show up. It was 12 o'clock. So I just went on up to the Bluebird, you know, <laughs> and hung out, you know. <laughs> well, life is something. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was uh, quite a few groups. He was one of them. And then there was another band around here at that time uh, called Little John and Merry Men. He had the likes of uh, Pep Adams, Frank, and I was in that group. I had, I had to play alto. Frank didn't want to play alto, so I played alto, and he played tenor. And uh, Pepper was on baritone, and Little John, the leader, was on trumpet. He had a very unique group, man. The sound, he had a arranger out of uh, Cleveland called Willie Smith that was uh, arranging him. He had some hip arrangements. See, at that time, he didn't find too many uh, sextets and uh, septets that had arrangements, you know? The group, it, it reached, the jazz, it reached that stage, you know, where you, you had arrangements, you know? So the band that didn't have arrangements, what were they doing? They were, they were playing, sounding good, because they had it together, you know? You, could, you could really couldn't say technically they didn't have an arrangement because they get together and rehearse and get it together. You know what I'm talking about. You mean like what, they play the head and then they just play solos? Yeah, play the solos head. and then play the out chord. They had little, little head arrangements, they called it. Mm -hmm. It sounded like arrangements, you know what I mean? They didn't have it down on paper. That was the only difference, you know. Wasn't written down. They'd get together over each other's house, you know, and hook it up. And that was uh, unique. That was unique. That's, that's the way uh, jazz was when I first went into it. You know what I mean? When I first heard it, rather. But when I went into it, guys were reading, you know? And they, they always been, gave me, a, always told me, man, learn how to read, because you're going to need it, you know? That's what I tell young cats today, man. Learn how to read, because it's, it's more to it than uh, just playing, you know? You have to learn how to, because you never make any money. You stay, it keeps you in one little corner all the time, you know. It's a lot to it, man. I can truthfully tell you that I never will cover it in my lifetime what I like to do in music, you know. It's a lifetime thing, you know. So uh, what are you doing now? Right now I'm doing, a, I'm doing a more writing right now, and I'm, I'm gigging a little, you know. I work a, a little, you know. With different groups, you know, what but I, I'm a, it's, it's just uh, 
more of a jazz thing, you know. What I what what I like, you know, experimenting too. I uh, I just like to tinker with it. I I I ran into this uh, by being around so many good musicians that uh, made me want to write too, you know. Because it's the other thing to hear hear something that you've written down, you know, and it comes out like you want to hear. It. You just have to keep experimenting, you know, because. I, I never went to school for that, you know. This is all just coming off the top of the head, you know. And by the way, I never had any formal training, you know. But and then again, you could say I did because I was around good musicians, see. see them, uh, guys like Wardell, you hear me mention, and Sonny Stitch, those guys were good musicians, you know. Billy Mitchell, excellent musicians. So being around them, it rubs off on you, you know. Cause, uh, Billy and I used to practice our exercise book, you know, together. That's the first thing he'd pull out on me, you know. I said, we come going over there to play, he'd pull out the exercise book. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was it was good. So I had I had a I had a training, you know I me, mean, from those guys, but never to just put the money in your pocket and go to a teacher, you know. I never did that, you know. I thought I could do it uh you know, by being around those guys, you know. That's that's what I've uh, done all my life, you know, that way. You know what you lack, so you work on it, you know. Well, to me, they're not, they're not new because I heard some guys playing like that when I was a kid, you know, <laughs> like some of these guys playing now, you know. But uh, I can't prove it because I, I haven't got it on record, you know. You know, some of them have a, a sound. Some guys don't rely on sound. It is play wild, you know, erratic like. But I really can't judge it because uh, that's the way the guy feels, you know. It's a personal thing to me, you know, music. That's what he that's what he hears, you know. You know, I really can't uh, can't whack on him, you know. I'd rather not, you know, why. But I a lot of it uh, I dismiss it, you know. I wouldn't want to play that way, you know. Cuz I think the main thing there is that Sound is the main thing. That's how you get to uh, the individual, the people out there listening to you. You gotta have a sound. Plus, you have to say something. It's like a conversation, you know what I mean? To me. It's not easy to do, but uh, that comes under the heading of, heading of uh, interpretation and concept, you know? Because uh, some people can talk out of tune and, and annoy you, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> so my goodness. Yeah, I, I wish him well, you know. I listen to him. I can't miss it. It's all around me, you know. Some of them I like. I heard uh, Bradford the other day with the Boston Pops. He, he's beautiful. He can play. Yeah, I like him. And you know I like when. But Bradford really impressed me, you know. So I have, I have guys, uh, these young cats I like. It's, it's one, it's a tenor player here I like. Uh, his name is uh, James Carter. He's uh, very energetic. He's, uh, you know how youth is. He get a little cocky, you know. And some some of the older guys tell me, oh, he's too cocky. I said, oh, no, man. I said, what, what are you talking about? I said, what, how were you when you were that age, you know? I don't think he's 20 yet, you know? Another one. I've heard, I've heard quite a few of uh, them. Had a chance to work with some of them, you know. Got a lot of energy, you know. So that's that's the way I, I'd rather handle that, you know. So I can't even explain jazz myself, but it's it's another feel, you know. And and then again, on the other hand, when I think about music, any type of music, any style, it's got to it's got to have some feeling, you know what I mean? You guys, what type of music you you're playing? Because when I was a kid, I found that out by playing a uh, Sousa. You know, I get a kick out of playing Sousa, but it's got to have a groove, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Shoot, I had the most fun I had was playing Sousa, trying to hear where he's going, you know? Mm -hmm. And don't say anything about the classics. See, I've been listening to classics ever since I was, you know, because my sister, uh, I was fortunate. My parents uh, played music, you know? My daddy uh, played piano and sax, and my mother played violin. My older sister was... Didn't, she didn't play any jazz at all. She just played concert music. So I sat right in that room and I used to listen to her play, you know. It fascinated me, you know. 
I used to listen to it. Hmm, you know, you know how a kid is. <laughs> so I, I, I wasn't prejudiced when it came to, you know, different uh, styles of music, you know. No, but I, I learned, like, just like I told you, right away that you had to play it. Whatever you played, it had to have some feeling to it. So that's, that's all I've ever gotten out of it, you know. That keeps me out of arguments, too, you know. <laughs> I hope. Hey, uh, another thing I want to tell you is that I, I lean towards the sound, you know, of music, you know. It, it's, it's important to me to maintain the sound, regardless if I'm playing fast or slow, you know. So this is what I try to do. I, I start out with a couple styles that I used to play. <laughs> just about and then the last one I have is, is what's happening with me today you know which I'm getting ready to go into now you know Thank you. 
To me, it's, it's much more freedom uh, in this. In the other aspects of music, you have to stick kind of close to to what the conductor or the way the composer wrote it. In jazz, you can inject your own feeling. You know, that's that's a. I think it's more it's more of a challenge because you you feel different every time you you pick it up. You know. You feel your interpretation is different every time you play it. That's why I lean this way, you know. In other words, this, to me, uh, some people use the word create. I, I'd rather not use the word create. I'd rather just say you interpret, you know, because there's nothing to create, really. Everything here, if you listen to everybody, everybody is playing a little bit of everybody. It's already been played. That covers all aspects of music, you know. And so I, that's why I lean towards it, you know. Because some days I, I wake up and I feel like I'm on, you know. And some days I'm, nothing happens, you know. Sounds horrible, you know. <laughs> like right now. <laughs> so you know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. That's, that's why I like the challenge, you know. Well, what, what, uh, what kind of advice would you give to a, a youngster coming up now who wanted to, you know, play jazz? I would, I would uh, tell him to listen to everybody he can listen to, you know, every chance he gets, and see him in person, you know, as much as possible. I tell him, and, and also tell him to uh, do his homework, you know what I mean, so he'd be ready for it. Because it, it's, it's an awful feeling, man, to get up on somebody's stand and don't be prepared, you know what I mean. At least have some idea, and the rest of or come if you work at it, you know, you just have to work at it. And what do you see as the future of jazz? Oh, boy. I hope it doesn't die, die out, you know what I mean, but like that. But then on the other hand, you make me think when I, about, uh, it never was too many guys that could really interpret it, you know what I mean, when you think of all the musicians that you have all around the country and the world. And so uh, it's a struggle, you know. I, hope, I just hope it doesn't die, you know, because it's, it's a wonderful art, I think, you know. I know it's, it's brought me some, uh, it's kept me alive, you know, because without it, I think I'd have withered away, you know, really. Because I put it down, like I forgot to tell you, I put this horn down for about 10 years. Got just sick of the game, you know. And I, something sparked me and I picked it back up, you know. So I've been back on it about 13 years now, you know. It's a struggle, man. It is a struggle. I have to, even if I don't feel like picking it up, I pick it up every day, you know. It is a struggle. What made you put it down, man? I just got tired of the life, you know. Get tired of hassling with the club owners and the promoters, you know, about the money. So I just went on and got me a day job, you know, live a straight life for a while. And then I think it was good for me because it uh, kept my health together, you know what I mean? Because I, I did some erratic things when I was a young man, you know? <laughs> Very erratic. So I think it prolonged my life a little bit. And I, you know, you find out that you have to be healthy to play one of these instruments, you know? Can't be sick and play, man. Well, what made you get back into it then? You missed it? Or? Oh, yeah, I missed it. I was, I was walking down the street one day on, on Woodward, <clears throat> and Marcus Belgrave had a, a workshop over there. I forget what year it was. So it's been about 13 years or 14. Anyway, and he had a, what they call a workshop. And I went in and listened. I said, man, it's showing me good to play again, you know. You get that old urge, you know. And so the guy, uh, some little young fellow there, he let me play his horn, you know. 
felt good, you know. I hadn't touched one in a long time. I hadn't even thought about it. So one thing led to another, and I wound up being down there with them, you know. It's a struggle, old man, you know. But uh, I'd been in it so long until it came back to me slowly, you know. And I kept on, so. And I swore it was down, I said, I'll never put it down again, you know. Even if I'm not, not uh, making any money out of it, you know. Because there's other ways to, to make money out of this, you know, arranging, you know. Make it that way if you don't play. Don't play enough. You, you really have to play, though. If I could work three nights, three to, just three nights a week would be good, you know. But that's, that's not happening today, you know. You don't have any so-called jazz clubs now, you know. You don't have an audience for it like you used to, you know. People haven't been introduced to it, you know. They've been tuned in uh, just the way they've been doing, you know, force it on, you know, keep playing on the radio, something, you know. So I'd advise, like you said, the young guy, my advice for him is just keep at it and listen and get some kind of concept what it's about. And don't get too cocky, you know. <laughs> I had to have a little, you know, but don't get too cocky. I've seen some cases out here, you know. So what are you gonna do? So, so what do you do when you want to? What What do you do when you feel like? What makes you feel like you're on top of your music? Um, do you feel like maybe your chops are getting down or something? Like, what do you do? Oh, I, I uh, immediately. Uh, take a little light break and think it over and see what, what I need. Most of the time I need a read. The reads that make the day are, uh, you know, poor quality. It's like this read sound like it's getting ready to go out on me, you know, now. It didn't sound like that yesterday, but that's, that was yesterday, you know. Mm -hmm. It had a better vibration. Anyway, uh, I see what, uh, what the trouble is and go, go on and take care of it. I, I never try to look for the excuse. It's always me, you know what I mean? But after I check the read out and get one that uh, will respond, I can, I can go on into it. A certain sound you want to see, after, after you've been playing so long, there's a certain sound you want out of the instrument. If you don't get it, it leaves you cold, you know. And you can, you can tell it, somebody else can tell it too, you know. Because you're not, look like everything you play is out of a line, you know. So imagine heaven, and, and, and what would be, if you had to just go and just sit in a room forever and listen to a band, what band would that be? Are you in town? Anywhere, anytime. Anywhere? Oh, it would be somebody like Ray Charles' band, and, and uh, those kind of groups. I, I see where Max is coming, I'll probably take Max off for the Montrose. Yes, yeah, that's, that's what I'd go see, something like that, you know. I didn't even go see Miles, you know. You know, a lot of people don't like, but all I hear Miles playing the same thing. He's been playing, but he's got a different rhythm behind him, you know. Yeah, I, I, I go see Sonny Rollins too, you know. There's certain guys I, I, I want to hear, you know, what they're doing, you know. Mm -hmm. I know what they can do, but I want to hear what they're doing now, you know. Yes, yeah, it's a slick. It's always been a select, you know, group of people, you know, you'd go listen. Because most of the guys that I know are gone now, you know. But there's still some guys around that can do it, you know. I start out with a couple of styles that I used to play. Mm -hmm. 